Glenn Van Zutphen on Saturday mornings with Neil Humphreys, only on Money FM 89.3. International News Review. Welcome back to Singapore Saturday morning on Money FM 89.3. Joining us now, Steve Oaken, uh, Senior Advisor at McClarty Associates, our International News Review. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, guys. Hey, hey, Neil, just for your next segment, I was having my coffee out front. Traffic on Cairn Hill, very light. So if people need a way to get around <laughs> the traffic on Orchard between Shaw and Paragon, Perfect alternative. You can recommend. Thank you, Steve. And that's just a little rejoinder to Fuji Ren, our regular listener, who says, I've jinxed the traffic this morning. But I haven't yet, Steve. Thank you for that important update. Uh, all right, Steve. And now all your neighbors are going to be loving you, the fact that all the traffic is going to shift to your road. So if everyone listening in Singapore could direct all traffic to Steve Oaken Street, <laughs> his neighbors would really appreciate it. Exactly. All right. Hey, buddy, let's get started. Lots on the go. Biden, one year successes failures uh there seem to be a number of both uh, where where uh, from your perspective uh, do we stand on biden's year one look i think the most important thing is to frame it in terms of what has he done in year one that sets him up for success in year two and and in that regard i think he is poised to have a good year two if a couple things happen to go right let's see where we were a year ago right the capital had just had an insurrection the worst since 18 you know, the War of 1812 when the British attacked. COVID was totally out of control. You know, where are we now? 74% of Americans are fully vaccinated. That's over 200 million Americans. Um, more people got jobs in 2021 than ever in history. 6.4 million uh, new jobs. More Americans have health care. Um, if you look at the, uh, from a foreign policy, U.S. came back to Paris. The U.S. alliance system is back. So things have gone right, especially when you, you overlay that on the, the American Rescue Plan, which is $1.9 trillion, and the, build, you know, the infrastructure bill, $1.2 trillion. Good things. However, he's got work to do. Inflation is, is too high. Um, he hasn't really made progress where he's told people he's going to make progress, especially on social issues and on voting rights. He's got to get that done. And if he does, then we will look back and say year one's a success. And if he doesn't, we'll say year one was a failure. And Steve, I read recently that he's the he's polling as the second least popular president after Donald Trump, which astonished me actually. I was surprised by that figure. So he's he's, he's rating figures the lowest, second lowest, after Trump. And I don't know. Maybe it's because he's followed Trump, who was front and center. He was a publicity magnet. We know that. And maybe it was a deliberate policy. You know, tell us if it was that he's very much seemed to have slipped slightly below the radar. Joe Biden in his first year, slightly below the public consciousness. He came out when he had to come out to talk about vaccines and COVID and when there were natural disasters. But generally speaking, he just hasn't seemed to connect, certainly not internationally. I don't know about domestically. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Was that a deliberate policy to almost be the anti-Trump when it came to media representation? Well, I mean, first, we've got a structural issue in the United States, and we have hyper-partisanship, and it works both ways. And it is now impossible for a Democrat to get Republican support, and it's basically impossible for a Republican mm. to get a Democrat support in, in, uh, when, when they are president. And so your polling is always going to be so low because you typically poll now in single digits approval from the other mm. party. That was true. It's true for Biden. It was true, true for Trump. It was true for Obama. It used to not be that way. It used to be that Republicans could say John Kennedy was doing a good job. It used to be able to say that Democrats could say Dwight Eisenhower, you know, was doing a good job. Even up to Richard Nixon, people would say, you know, some Republicans, Democrats might say Nixon was doing a good job, especially in his first term. And so that's over. And so no president is ever going to really have approvals maintained in the 60s like it used mm. to be. Biden did learn. He's, he said, I've been acting too much as a senator and less as a president. I've been spending too much time negotiating with Democrats like I used to do when I was in the Senate and not enough leading. So there is some element, Neil, to the leadership style that he is going to change. But some of it is structural. And we are stuck with this as the United States and, and for, the, for the foreseeable future, no matter who is in the White House. Well, other other uh, you know critics would say, look, 
he's he has owned Washington legislatively, Capitol Hill, you know, Democrats, and he has not been able to be effective on certain things like climate change, uh, election reform. Uh, and, you know, this is the guy that promised everybody, hey, I know how Washington works and I'm going to get stuff done. As you mentioned, he was, you know, trying to work with people and talk to people. But let's be honest, his party runs the show and he can't get some of these basic things done that he promised in the elections. This is not a good sign, especially going into a second term. I mean, I hear what you're saying. He might set himself up for some kind of success. But, boy, once the midterms hit, he's done. Because he I mean, may not have that. He won't. He won't have that majority There's, again. I mean, nobody thinks that, nobody honestly believes that he will maintain any sort of uh, lock on on uh, on the legislative branch like he has now. Okay, well, well two things. Glenn. He hasn't gotten some things done yet. And that's the operative word here is okay. yet. What can he get done in, in, in the first quarter? We'll get $1.2 trillion for infrastructure. How many times did we joke and say, oh, you know, it's infrastructure week in, in the Trump administration, and it never happened, and Donald and, and Joe Biden got a bipartisan infrastructure bill through the Congress. So big success there in year one. Can he get chunks of what he wants to get done that you mentioned? Can he get climate change passed, this chunk of, of Build Back Better as a, as a standalone, and get half mm. a trillion dollars so that we can address climate change, which we need to do? Can he get universal pre-kindergarten? Funded. Those are things all Democrats, including the, 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 those senators who are voting against him right now, will come on board for. So he can he can get that done. I'm not saying he will, but he can get that done. And when it comes to voting rights, there's two issues. There's there's voter suppression and there's voter subversion. Voter subversion is much more uh, damaging to the United States. Voter suppression is when you pass laws that, that you have to have an ID to come vote or you limit how much water you can have when you drink in line. Those things are bad enough. But voter subversion is when states are passing laws like they did in Georgia, which mm -hmm. takes the right to certify the election away from the secretary of state and give it to a partisan legislature. That is subverting the voting process, and that has to stop. And there is a bipartisan consensus coming together in the Senate to pass reforms to the Electoral Count Act from the 1800s that can address that issue. So you can get those things passed in Q1 or Q2, Glenn, you're right. It's got to get done well before the midterms and then it's over. I'm yeah. hopeful and optimistic for the country that those things can pass. And just briefly, um, how has he been for Singapore and the region? You know, it was a long time before we got we got one of these uh, high-ranking officials visiting this part of the world. There was that recent democracy summit, which, you know, put a few noses out of joint when Singapore wasn't invited. That seemed like a bit of a political faux pas. How has he done for Singapore and the region in terms of American relations? I want to steal the phrase from my, our, our friend James Crabtree, who says that, like, Biden faces a trilemma. In, in Asia, right? He's got to deal with China. That's trilemma one. He's got he's got the Indo-Pacific, and then he's got ASEAN. He's got nowhere with China. China's basically where we were a year ago with Trump. The tariffs are still in place. We're not getting any 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 better in terms of cooperation in a meaningful way other than here and there on climate. So China, work in progress. Indo-Pacific, he's brought the alliance system back, right? So that is a mm. positive um, from a military perspective, um, ASEAN, he's made the outreach. You know, Vice President was here. Secretary of Defense was here. And so we're getting that type of engagement in ASEAN. But now this is he's got to put the, you know, the meat on the bones. What does an Indo-Pacific economic framework actually mean? Are you going to get a digital trade deal through? It's great to talk about supply chain resilience. How are you going to make the supply chain more resilient? Those things have to happen this year. Neil, he set up himself for success, but now it's time to execute. Well, and Steve, last week, I think it was, you spoke very forcefully uh, in some other uh, interviews you did about the need for the U.S. to uh, quickly appoint a very high-level ASEAN, you know, ambassador to ASEAN, uh, and to make that happen, uh, given some of the missteps that have uh, happened over uh, recent years. Uh, so that is a, yet another element of the, you know, re-rebalancing to Asia uh, that the U.S. needs to look at. Um, let tell you what, let's talk about that one in future conversations because um, we need to move on. Uh, but uh, I do want to tee that one up for, for weeks to come because I think that's an important discussion too, uh, the ASEAN discussion. All right, let's move on to Olympics preview. Now, last week, uh, Steve, uh, he was on, uh, a guy called Bennett Freeman was on who's been working 
uh, against um, uh, forced labor with the Uyghur community uh, and the challenges that his uh, organization that he's been working with trying to get some information from the IOC on uh, what their due diligence has been toward uh, uh, producing merchandise for the Beijing Olympics coming up uh, next month, and uh, they had not been uh, successful in in um, getting some of those responses. We did get a response from the IOC. I had asked for it in advance of the show, and we got it about 12 hours after the show uh, last week. Uh, and so I just want to mention that. But, but tee up the issue for us uh, briefly, Steve, before I get into that response from the IOC. Well, I mean, the broader issue, and if you have said to me at the beginning of the year, who is going to deport more athletes because it is against their public interest, Australia or China? I just say, well, that's, that's a trick question. Of course it would be China, but it looks like it's going to be Australia, which actually is going to, to win, win that contest. And, and it gets to that question of public interest. And China, of course, has a very strong view on what it sees as its public interest. And, and the core of that is you do not interfere in what we consider to be our domestic politics and our domestic policies. And the issue that is, is front and center for a lot of the athletes um, and for what you discussed last week is forced labor uh, in Xinjiang um, in, uh, when it comes to, to the Uyghur um, population. Um, and this is something that athletes have focused on, it's something that human rights groups have focused on, and it's something that China has said, this is none of your business. And that is what is being debated right now and what we are certainly going to watch going into the Olympics because China very explicitly warned foreign Olympic athletes coming in that you will not speak out on politics at the Winter Games. Yeah. What, what do you seriously think will happen if they do? Because I have a, you know, I've covered many sporting tournaments over the last 20 years, so I have a healthy cynicism to this thing. Before every major tournament, every Olympics, every World Cup, there's something. You've got the labor abuses in Qatar. You had the previous China Olympics, the Summer Olympics. There was all talk of human rights then, boycotts. Nothing really happened. You had the Russia World Cup. There was all kinds of talk of boycott. Nothing happened. What do you seriously think, if anything, will come out of this? Well, I think the question, Neil, is, you know, what, what expectation do we have for the athletes? What expectation should there be mm. on the athletes? They've trained for their whole lives for this one moment. Um, they know that they will be violating potentially the Olympic, the, their Olympic commitment, because the Olympics says you're not allowed to talk politics, as well as is Chinese law. And which is why I, I think we're going to see more athletes deported out of Australia this year um, uh, for politics uh, and public interest than you're going to see deported out of China. Uh, it's a real dilemma uh, for the sponsors. Um, you know, the U.S., uh, and the UK and the Canadians, they and the, they can all do a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics, but the athletes can't. And so I think that's what I think it's going to be a pretty subdued uh, environment. And I think, look, there's there's some fear here. I mean, you have to have an app, you know, to go into Beijing, like you have to have Trace Together here. Uh, but the app in in China seems to have a, a device where if you you use, uh, you know, any certain words that you shouldn't be using, Tiananmen, you know, Uyghurs, Xinjiang, Facebook. that notifies the authorities. Right? So it's, it's, there's a lot of pressure on the yeah. athletes, a lot of yeah. oversight. I don't think we're going to see much. Uh, let me just go ahead and read a part of the statement. It was quite a lengthy email from the IOC media team sent to me uh, last Saturday night after this show aired. Uh, but in, in part it says um, Beijing 2022 has released its pre-game sustainability report. The report also addresses the topic of responsible sourcing by the organizing committee. We suggest you contact Beijing 2022 for more information. They continue. With regard to its own supply chain, the IOC has developed the IOC supplier code. In addition, the IOC has defined sustainable sourcing criteria for 21 categories of products uh, and engages with suppliers to raise awareness and carries out targeted due diligence on a sample basis. The IOC recently carried out third-party due diligence social audits of its own uniforms, which will be provided by ANTA, uh, which is the Chinese uh, uniform provider at the Games. In 2022, uh, the results demonstrated no issue in relation to forced labor, and more information will be released next week. Um, the, the email does go on and on, and, and similarly says, look, 
you know, we're doing our best. We're looking at this stuff. They also said that, quote, therefore, any engagement of the IOC must logically be within its established remit of concerns that are directly related to the Olympic Games. The coalition themselves offer to engage on a pre-agreed terms of confidentiality, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So they're saying they've done what they can do mm. on their side for their uniforms, uh, but they are their remit is a narrow in terms of they can't be the police over the entire games. Is that a surprise to you, Steve? Well, the, the real question here is what is the definition of forced labor? And that's, and, and they don't say what that definition of forced labor is that, you know, the, there's, there's international standards that, that give, give basics for forced labor. Like, do you give, you know, do people get paid over time? Um, are you taking migrant workers' passports away from them so they can't leave, right? There, there's all of these elements that go into the definition of forced labor. What the U.S. government has said is, is basically is because there is a genocide occurring in Xinjiang, any labor that occurs in Xinjiang through the use of Uyghurs, especially at these, at these camps, would be by definition, you know, forced labor. Uh, with 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 and, and that's what we don't know what the IOC is saying and so I think that's it, it so you can yeah say well we're, we're we're not allowing forced labor but what do you mean by that so that's the first thing you look at and then you know I, Glenn I know you shared that with me and then I did some research as well because this is one of my subject areas and when you looked at the sustainability report for Beijing Olympics they talk about sustainability when it comes to climate when it comes to venue construction when it comes to regional development and getting 300 million people involved in winter sports so they're not looking the beijing olympic committee is not looking at forced labor because they would say well there is no forced labor in china all labor mm -hmm. in china follows chinese law that's why there's this disconnect um, when it comes to this issue well that's fascinating steve and it moves on very nicely to our next topic and, uh, oh, sorry, by the way i put those links in the yep. facebook live uh, chat by the way for both the ioc statement of uh, and the beijing 2020 2022 statement so those are in our facebook uh, page go ahead Niels. good no i was going to say this next story very much in your wheelhouse steve at mm -hmm. mcclarty associates you know you deal with companies all the time and how they work in different territories, different societies, different cultures, what kind of ad works, what kind of campaign doesn't. And here we've got Samsung, who just pulled an ad showing a Muslim mother expressing support for her drag queen son after a backlash from some parts of the Muslim community. In a Facebook post on Wednesday, Samsung said it was aware the video, in inverted commas, may be perceived as insensitive and offensive. Now, this is a BBC report, and it seems to suggest that the ad was pulled in Singapore. What are your thoughts on that? You know, someone who, work, who does this for a living, who, who works with companies and how they should conduct themselves, organize campaigns in various cultures, countries. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, to, to, to Neil, first, I went and looked in, in, in online, and according to Insider, which is a, you know, a great news source in, uh, based here, uh, in Singapore, they have an office here. This ad was produced by Samsung Singapore Arm, and it was running here. So this was a locally produced ad for mm. Singapore, and so Samsung should have known that there what the what the culture is here, and either they're going to accept some criticism or they're not. So th so there was bad planning, I think, on the part of Samsung of not thinking this through. Um, and you don't blame the production team. Somebody who reviewed this ad should have said, "We need to think if we're willing to put this up or not." From a public affairs perspective, what they have done is taken what was not a story whatsoever. You'd have had a couple of people who have every right to, to say we disagree with this ad. But when they yep. pull it, they've now created a story. So you've taken a story that didn't exist, and now you're, you've made global news to be debated. And so right. you as Samsung have not just said we've got to deal with, with Singapore and whether or not it's appropriate to show a a a Muslim woman showing her unconditional love for her drag queen son. But now we're debating this in the United States and Britain and it's gone global. So they've really created, I think, a hash out of out of the response as well. So do you think corporations should therefore be tougher and just ride it out? I mean, what is what is your thought on that? Well, again, the first thing you do is figure out, are we you should you could have predicted this. So yeah, exactly. this is where <laughs> Yes. And this is where you've got to have you've got to have an understanding as a business that mm. you are now judged by everybody everywhere. And you are going to take some hits for what you do. 
by anybody. And so you need to, you, before you put this ad up, you say, okay, what can we anticipate coming? Because this is a pretty interesting, you know, ad in, 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 in terms of, you know, showing uh, different cultures and how they can, in, for, for, for a commercial that has to do with wearables, right? <laughs> this, this is a no. wearables commercial. Know it up front, and then once you make go forward with it, you got to stick to your 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 principles um, and say you have every right to be you know upset by this. This is not what we meant. You could have crafted a statement to say we ex we understand what you're saying. We will take it into account going forward. But this is the ad, and we're gonna we're gonna live with it. I mean, I would yeah. have guessed that would have been a better response. Interesting. All right, let's move on from that. Our last story, briefly, Thailand's cannabis penalties go up in smoke. Thailand this week held a key government meeting expected to help pave the way for rescinding jail terms and fines for cannabis possession. It will become, uh, after becoming the first country in Southeast Asia to legalize medical cannabis and its use in food and cosmetics, public health ministry is now set to delist the plant from the country's narcotics list. This is a big move that is going to have repercussions around Asia, Steve. Mm. Well, look, you know, as you know, and is, is, you know, you know, our kids go to school in Colorado where it's totally legal. Uh, it's mm. like, what's, you know, it's kind of the, the question is what's taking people so long um, to recognize that, you know, the decriminalization of marijuana is where, where the world has been headed. Uh, it's, it, it is going to be a first mover advantage um, to a country that is going to open up uh, when it comes uh, to tourism, uh, because so many people who have access to marijuana now back home in Europe, in the United States, and Canada, and other countries, and if they want to partake when they're on holiday, why not? Um, and so I think this is this is this is inevitable, and you know, and I think Thailand's going to have a first mover advantage on it. But have to be mindful of the fact, Steve, that I can't see this happening in Singapore anytime soon. No, of course not. Like every country is 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 makes its own decisions. Um, but you also compete with with you know you compete for tourist dollars. You compete you know for foreign investment. You compete for all sorts of different things. And you know Thailand. From all the studies you read, there's going to be upside from this in terms of tourist dollars, in terms of tax revenue, in terms of new businesses being set up, certainly in the in, in the cannabis section in, in Thailand, that's going to advantage them, you know, over other countries in the region. And so it certainly would make it makes sense for Thailand and for Singapore, it makes sense to not legalize because it's not going to get the same type of tourist it doesn't want the mm -hmm. same type of tourist so it does make perfect sense when you look at it that one would do it one would interesting stuff all right steve we're gonna have to leave it there thanks so much uh, for being with us again today steve oh quickly meatloaf you mm -hmm. saw him in 97 i he look the greatest quick. <laughs> rock the greatest rock opera of all time bad out of hell look i love the who i love tommy I love queen love night at the opera bad out of hell greatest album I saw Meatloaf at the presidential inaugural ball in 1997, wow. second inaugural, and boy, he was such an amazing performer and uh, uh, will certainly uh, live on. The number one selling album of all time in Australia is Bad Out of Hell. Not ACDC, not the Bee Gees, not anything else, Bad Out of Hell. So popular <laughs> globally. All right, Steve, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks, guys.